Friends, welcome uh, to this uh, online worship of First Presbyterian Church. We are delighted that you have joined us. Uh, welcome. Uh, uh, several pieces of information as we get started. Immediately following this service, we have a connect with your neighbor opportunity uh, via Zoom, and information as to how to access that get together is available on our Facebook page. And so I hope to see you and uh, visit with you uh, over that format. Additionally, uh, some of you may have come out on uh, Wednesday evening uh, to see the movie Just Mercy, or perhaps you have read the book. If you have not done either, I would encourage you to do so. It's a great opportunity to uh, uh, learn more about uh, um, ways in which we can seek justice for our neighbors uh, throughout our community. Once again, welcome. Let us worship God. Only the hungry search for bread. Only the thirsty look for water. This is a place for those who are hungry and thirsty in spirit. Only those who ache for meaning will pursue it. Only those who yearn for a deeper life will seek it. This is a place for those who ache and yearn for something more. So let us come here today with our hunger and thirst, our unsatisfied longings, our heartfelt yearnings, and let the God of life satisfy our souls.
Friends, let us confess our sin using the prayer before us. We bring to God all that is comfortable and self-satisfied in us, and we let it go. We bring to God the times we have avoided the struggle, taken the line of least resistance, colluded, and let them go. And because we believe that God does bless us, we bring to God our questions and doubts and uncertainties, and we offer them. We bring to God all that we find hard to deal with, tasks, relationships, feelings, decisions, and we offer them. We bring to God all the messy, unwinnable struggles and adversities that we face, and we offer them. Amen. And now, friends, hear these words of assurance. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that God has made. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling down and raises up all who are bowed down. Hear the words of the Lord. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Mr. Todd here. So today we are talking about generosity. And I feel like I know what that word means. Do you know what it means? Do you know what it means to be generous? We all probably have a sense for it, but I wanted to make sure I really, really understood. So I wanted to look it up in the dictionary. But the problem with printed dictionary books is that sometimes you lose them and can't find your dictionary. So I'm going to use modern technology today to help us. OK, Google, what does generosity mean? Here's the definition of generosity, the quality of being kind and generous. The quality of being kind and generous. So I did this earlier. Then I looked up generous, and it said to be kind. And I looked up kind, and it said to be generous. So I don't really feel like I have that much better of an understanding of what generosity is. But maybe we need to go to a different source. How about this one? So as we look up today's story in the Bible, we can get a good picture of what generosity looks like. It doesn't tell us the definition, but it shows us what generous living is like. And so the Bible is our best source or our best app for knowing what generosity is really all about. So today's story talks about Christians in a place called Macedonia. And they heard that there were people in Jerusalem who loved God but didn't have the things that they needed. Now the people in Macedonia didn't have really that much money. Most people would probably say they were poor. But the people in Jerusalem were even worse off. So 
they generously gave to help the people in Jerusalem. And so, as I imagine it, I, I picture the people saying, Hey, Paul, how are the Christians in Jerusalem doing? And him saying, Well, not too good. You see, they don't have enough money to buy the things that they need. And so the people generously gave all the money that they had, even beyond really what they should have given, because they had their own things to buy too. But they wanted to give as generously as they could. And then they say, well, is there anything else you can tell us about the Christians in Jerusalem. And Paul said, well, I've been hearing that they're cold at night. And so the people would have said, well, we have blankets. Let us share all the blankets that we have so that they can be warm at night. And so they gave generously. They gave out of what they had and what they needed to share with people who had even a little bit less. They said, well, how else? Or what else can you tell us about how the Christians in Jerusalem are doing? And he said, well, because they're so poor, they don't have enough food to eat. And so the people would say, let us use all the flour that we have to bake bread so that they can have food to eat. And they shared all that they had. They gave away their food so that others could have food. And I said, well, what else can you tell us about the Christians in Jerusalem? And he said, well, some of our friends in Jerusalem who love God very much are living on the street because they can't afford houses. And so the people would have said, well, here, let us give them all our building materials so that they can have a home that they could build and live in. So they shared. They shared so much of what they had to help those in need, even though this was stuff that they needed too. Well, they probably said, what else can you tell us about the Christians in Jerusalem? And he said, well, they don't really have enough clothes to wear. The clothes that they have are falling apart and they need clothes. So the people in Macedonia said, here, let us give them our clothes all except for the ones that we're wearing. And they gave so generously. They said, we can make do with a little bit that we have. We'll give away any extra that we have to take care of our neighbors and friends in Jerusalem. So they gave. They gave so generously. And so they gave of their money, um, and, and they probably gave of anything else that they would be able to share. So. As I think about the definition of generosity, we read earlier that it's the act of being generous or kind, but it's certainly more than that. It's a willingness to give well beyond what anyone would expect. Generosity is surprising someone with amazing love and kindness. Living generously is the way that God calls us to live because God is the one who is more generous than any of us, who didn't withhold anything to save us. He gave his own son the most generous gift of all. And that is how he calls us to live, to live generously, to give without expecting anything in return. This is generosity. So. Today, whether you pause now or maybe talk about this at the end of the service, talk with others about what it truly means to be generous and how you can be part of God's generous giving. Let's join in a word of prayer as we talk to God about that. Let's pray. Dear God, you are so generous and you call us to be generous to. Help us look for ways to show love 
by doing very kind things. Amen. Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 through 15. Brothers and sisters, we want to let you know about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. While they were being tested by many problems, their extra amount of happiness and their extreme poverty resulted in a surplus of rich generosity. I assure you that they gave what they could afford and even more than they could afford, and they did it voluntarily. They urgently begged us for the privilege of sharing in this service for the saints. They even exceeded our expectations because they gave themselves to the Lord first and to us, consistent with God's will. As a result, we challenged Titus to, re to finish this work of grace with you the way he had started it. Be the best in this work of grace in the same way that you are the best in everything, such as faith, speech, knowledge, total commitment, and the love we inspired in you. I'm not giving an order, but by mentioning the commitment of others, I'm trying to prove the authenticity of your love also. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes, so that you could become rich through his poverty. I'm giving you my opinion about this. It's your advantage to do this, since you not only started to do it last year, but you wanted to do it too. Now finish the job as well, so that you finish it with as much enthusiasm as you started, given what you can afford. A gift is appreciated because of what a person can afford, not because of what that person can't afford. It's apparent that it's done willingly. It isn't that we want others to have financial ease and you financial difficulties, but it's a matter of equality. At the present moment, your surplus can fill their deficit, so that in the future, their surplus can fill your deficit. In this way, 
there is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered more didn't have too much, and the one who gathered less didn't have too little. I want to begin by telling you two stories. I've changed the names to protect the innocent and the guilty. The first story is about Chip. He lived in my neighborhood when we were boys. We played ball together. We fished together. We were in scouts together. We traded baseball cards and comic books with one another. Chip stayed in trouble with his mother and father. He couldn't keep up with anything. Chip, where's your baseball, your mitt, your bat? They would ask him constantly. I don't know, he would answer. And he would get similar questions about where his fishing pole was and where his scout handbook was and what had become of all of his baseball cards and comic books. Again, Chip's answer was, I don't know. Chip was being less than honest with his parents. He let them believe that he was forgetful and disorganized. And they let Chip believe that they believed that he was forgetful and disorganized. The truth was that Chip was generous. The baseball, the mitt, the bat, the fishing pole, the scout book, the baseball cards, the comic books, he gave them away to those he believed needed them more than he did. You've no doubt heard the, the statement, generous to a fault. Well, that was Chip. If you needed it, and Chip had it, he gave it to you. If someone said about Chip, he'll give you the shirt off his back, they were telling the truth, the literal truth. Every kid in the neighborhood knew it. So did Chip's parents. You know, I often wondered how many baseball mitts his parents bought each summer. Indulging a kid's generosity had to be expensive. Chip was also that kid that sat with the new kid that no one included, and nearly everyone avoided. Chip was also that kid that didn't laugh at a joke that was at someone else's expense and would say something to the kid who told the joke. Chip was that kid who took the long way home in order to keep you company on your walk home from school because you had a bad day. That's Chip's story. Now I want to tell you Frankie's story. Frankie had a sharp tongue and used it often. If there was something you were um, self-conscious about or insecure about, he had a knack for honing in on it pointing it out to everyone with an earshot and making sure whatever it was became a point of derision, the joke du jour. And a lot of people would laugh 
at what Frankie had to say in order to avoid becoming his next victim. Kids wanted to be on Frankie's good side, not because they admired him, but because they loathed him. Frankie was very different from Chip. If you had something Frankie wanted, he would take it and dare you to do something about it. He was bigger than most kids and could easily get away with it. I remember Frankie taking a kid's Reese's peanut butter cups, a two-pack, at lunch one day. I was that kid. They were my peanut butter cups, my favorite. I put up a tussle, but Frankie got them away from me. He didn't eat them, though. He opened the package, dropped both of them onto the floor, and ground them into the floor with his foot with a grin on his face. There was this perverse delight in his eyes as tears welled up in my eyes. Frankie was selfish. He was the center of every story he told. Everything he said and did was the biggest and the best Nothing compared. No one else compared. And Frankie was mean. If he ever noticed someone else's feelings, I never saw it. There are my two stories. Chip and Frankie. Today's sermon is sermon number five from a five- sermon series on 2 Corinthians. In the course of this letter of Paul, Paul provides a broad range of counsel. Today's counsel is to be generous, even to a fault. Be generous out of the love of God for you in Christ. If Paul told Chip and Frankie's story, he would say, be like Chip. You know, this passage is often used during stewardship, stewardship season in a congregation's life because it has to do with giving. And it's a great text on giving. The context is Paul's collection for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. The Apostolic Council, when they sent Paul on his missionary journeys to other nations, asked him to remember the poor in Jerusalem. The Jewish Christians were having a particularly rough go of it in Jerusalem. And Paul honored the council's request by collecting an offering for them everywhere he went so that they would have adequate food and adequate shelter. Most sermons on this text went something like this. Learn from the way others give. For example, the Macedonians. They were poor, but gave nonetheless. Two, give a proportion of what you have. This is where the idea of a tithe comes from. A little from a lot may be a lot, but proportionately it may not be mu that much at all. And a lot from a little may be little, but proportionally it's nearly everything. And three, share what you have with those who have nothing or very little. And all of those would be good sermons. But here's the thing. 
I'm not sure we can assign rules to giving, rules to generosity. Things like giving and generosity are more matters of the heart, matters of the Spirit, matters of God's Holy Spirit. What Paul has to say about generosity in 2 Corinthians doesn't make sense apart from his understanding of the church. Theology has a big word for it. It's called ecclesiology. You know, for Paul, the church is the one body of Christ in the world. We are in ministry together. When one part of the body is joyous, all parts of the body are joyous. And when one part of the body is sorrowful, all parts of the body are sorrowful. We see each other and care for one another and know our lives are connected by ties that bind in ways we can only begin to understand. The poor in Jerusalem who needed the help of the Corinthians had already received the help of the Macedonians weren't just those people over there who were having a rough go of it. The poor in Jerusalem were part of the Corinthians and part of of the Macedonians. And the Corinthians and the Macedonians were part of them. And the poor in Jerusalem at that point needed the Macedonians, needed the Corinthians. For Paul, if the Corinthians decided to turn away from the poor in Jerusalem and not see their need, that was a problem. And this was an issue because they were mad at Paul and were tempted to turn away and not see the poor in Jerusalem to get back at Paul. But there was a bigger problem. And the bigger problem was this. By turning away from the poor in Jerusalem, and not seeing their need, failing to be compassionate, empathetic, generous, they were risking ceasing to be the church. The beginning of a lack of concern for neighbor in need is the beginning of the end of the church. There's a word for this. It's selfishness. You know, I know that's a strong statement, but it's true, and I will say it another way. The beginning of a lack of concern for a neighbor in need is the beginning of the end of our humanity. Paul's concern for the Corinthians and their generosity grew out of his understanding of the church, when Christians separate themselves from neighbors in need, for example, when the Corinthians considered not seeing the poor in Jerusalem, we risk separating ourselves from Christ. Paul's counsel concerning generosity also grows out of his understanding of Christ. Christ had it all. The best seat in heaven at God's right hand. One of the three persons in the Trinity, the Son. But he set his divinity aside, though Paul tells us, and became fully human to know us, to live our experience, to forgive us to love us, to guide us, to die for us, to defeat death for us, to unite us to God. If we want an image of generosity, I think 
this one of Christ is a good one. I would make the case that it is the best one. You know, the world is in a hard place right now. A pandemic, high unemployment, uncertainty and anxiety over whether we will ever return to a status quo that we recognize. Church life, school life, social events, inequities of every sort, economic, social, racial, a changing climate, dysfunctional politics and governance, anger, divisiveness, and even hatred are bubbling up and spilling over. So are sadness and despair. From my perspective, fellow citizens are beginning to see other fellow citizens as the enemy. That's not us. That's wrong. So where do we turn? What's our next move? Those are not just rhetorical questions in a sermon that I am now going to answer. They are sincere questions because I'm seeking the answer right along with you. Most of us have little or no experience with pandemics. We've not lived through one before. We haven't lived through a moment quite like this. But as a Christian, I have some ideas as to the answer to that question, where do we turn? What is our next move? What if? What if? We lead with generosity. A generosity not only of resources, but a generosity of spirit. What if we listen first and speak second? What if we give others the benefit of the doubt rather than labeling them as wrong-headed or misguided? What if we set aside what we want and consider instead what others need. What if when someone observes that we said or uh, something we said or did crossed a line, perhaps even a racial line, that we respond with gratitude, thank you, and resolve to do better next time, as in, thank you, I wasn't aware. I appreciate you pointing that out to me. I'll try to do better. Too often, as we know all too well, it doesn't happen that way. There's defensiveness, and then a counterattack, and then a broken relationship, and nothing changes. I want to go back to Chip's story. The more I thought about Chip this week, the more it occurred to me that his generosity grew out of the fact that he was the type of person who made everyone he came across feel perfectly okay with who they were. That's rare. And when we experience this kind of welcome, this kind of acceptance, this kind of belonging, this kind of generosity, anything and everything becomes possible, including salvation. I want to be that kind of person. I want the church to be that kind of of community. And with God's help, I will be. With God's help, we will be. Amen. Will you pray with me? 
God of abundant compassion and extravagant love, we join our hearts and voices in prayer to you, trusting your promise to hear and respond, not as we deserve, but as your mercy dictates. When we look within ourselves, we are saddened by the many ways we fall short of delighting in your law. We heed the advice of the wicked without even recognizing we are neglecting your commandments. We hurt those closest to us, injure those whom call us to be compassionate toward and dread the consequences of our own behavior. And yet it is in those dark and lonely places that you appear and bless us. Make of us new creations and restore us for your divine purposes. We praise you for your unwillingness to let us go and we cling to you now as we wrestle within the chaos around and in us. We rejoice that you are present right here in this place. God of bread and fish, hillsides and healing, we come to you like the crowds, in need of relief, fearful we do not have enough, eager to see Jesus face to face. We heed his instruction to sit, and we cannot believe that the Savior of the world serves us and refuses to send us away. Having been satisfied with the bread of heaven, we ask to be a part of distributing the mercy grace, and justice of our Lord. We know we have been blessed in order to be a blessing to others. In that recognition, we remember those in our midst who are hungry. As this pandemic continues and many wrestle with unemployment or underemployment or dangerous employment, we ask that you continue to be with us and be with them. We ask that you continue to calm anxious hearts as people are worried about their well being and the well being of those they love. We know that all around us, your beloved children long for healing in body, mind, or spirit. We know you see them with compassion and want for them abundant life. May we be conduits for Christ's power, embodying your love to all. God of blessing and sending, we count the ways you come to us and give us that which we need. We revel in the beauty of creation. We relish in the care of friends and family. We enjoy the taste of food, the voice of a loved one, the familiar melodies of hymns, and the everyday mercies that are new every morning. As we sing our praise and express our thanks, we ask you to empower us to participate in your compassionate care for all the earth and every creature upon it. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, our giving is one way of saying thank you to God for what God has given to us. It's an act of gratitude. It's also an act of worship. Just as we present our words in liturgy and song and prayer to God, we present a portion of the fruit of our work to God our money. May we reflect on what we have been given and respond by giving generously to the work of God through this community, 
let us present our offering. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as you choose. Here am I, all of me. As we leave this time together, remember that we do not go alone. God is close at hand. God hears the cry of all who call on God's name. God honors those who honor God, listening to their prayers, coming to their aid. So go from here with joy and with confidence to love and serve God and one another. Amen.